Hello, I'm Fiona Thompson and welcome to this RTS Yorkshire Talks. And tonight we have a real treat for you. Top Guns, a series going inside the RAF on operations, has just finished its run on Channel 4. But it's still available to watch on all four. BBC Soldier has just started with the first episode going out last week on the 5th of October. But all episodes are available on iPlayer. Now this series, Soldiers, follows a group of civilians as they embark on the rigorous training as infantry soldiers. Both have a Yorkshire connection, which makes us at RTX Yorkshire immensely proud. Top Guns is made by True North and takes us to RAF Lossiemouth in the Highlands of Scotland, and from there to Estonia and to Cyprus. Soldier is filmed in Catrick, up in Yorkshire. Two documentaries with production teams embedded within military environments, and both bring a sense of jeopardy, of personal development, of testing oneself in extraordinary situations and of the ramifications of poor judgments. But if you've ever wondered what it is like to fly a typhoon or to shoot a GMPG, which I can tell you is a general purpose machine gun, then these series allow you to do this from the comfort of your own living room with minimum jeopardy. I'm joined today by Mark Tattersall, executive producer of Top Guns, and by Paul Wells, Series Director of Soldier. Welcome, Mark. Welcome, Paul. Nice to Mark, I'm going to start with you, but feel free to join in, Paul, as I know you also directed some of the Top Guns episodes. Now, Top Guns has just finished. What's been the audience response and what did Channel 4 think of it? It went down really well. We were obviously charting quite closely on social media um, and Channel 4 just told us um, just last week or so, it's their biggest uh, new documentary series in the last four years in terms of audience numbers, which is which is lovely. Uh, we were something like 35 to 45% above the slot average on a Monday night for that 9 p.m. slot, which was great. Um, we got lots of good press, lots of good reviews, very kind things written about us. So that went down well, both the Channel 4 and the RAF. Uh, the RAF ultimately did this because they wanted to enhance their reputation and increase their recruitment. They've been struggling quite a lot over the last 12 months um, due to largely some some errors in judgment that were made internally, there's been reports out, and and ultimately the 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 previous head of the RAF uh, left under a little bit of a cloud because of what happened during their recruitment process, where they promoted some people in advance of others. So in order to to sort of rebalance that to address that, they wanted to sort of invite the cameras in, you know, off the back of what was a tricky time for them ultimately in the press. Um, and fortunately, we we were there at the right time, maximised on on that opportunity, um, and delivered a show to Channel Four that they seem really really chuffed with. Actually, that you know, for me and Cats on Down, um, they've they've said some really kind things about it, and um, yeah, we're really proud of it. So basically, everybody, RAF Channel Four viewers, all happy with it. That's it's the best thing ever. Yeah, the best thing ever. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, and also, yeah, I mean, the, the timing came in with uh, with Top Top Gun Maverick as well. You know, that's uh, we go from the the Hollywoodization of it through to actually what actually really happens. Uh, but Paul, Soldiers only just started, so it's probably a bit earlier to get any sense of audience reaction to it. But have you had any? I mean, we've been with uh, with big episode one was received really well. Uh, we've got some nice reviews in the press and some good previews, picks of the day and. Um, and we it's done um, reasonably well on BBC One on its first night out. Um, but also, I think the BBC were especially keen for this series because they're I think they're looking to try. We're looking to try and hit a younger de demographic. Certainly, this is part of that kind of plan. It's not normal that a BBC One would put a. This might normally be a BBC Two show, but it, it, you know, BBC BBC One nine o'clock sort of unusual. But they were looking to try and get a younger audience, and that they're looking more at the BB at the iPlayer and what it does on iPlayer and we all know that sort of that is probably where it's going in terms of I'm sure Channel 4 are looking at the all four rather than just the view overnights um so yeah it's still a bit too early to know um we get that in 28 days apparently so but yeah so far so good where everyone seems to be happy at the moment so and I think that's one of the interesting things with, with, with Soldier you're, you're we're mainly focusing on 17 18 19 20 21 year olds they're all relatively young, the men and women, embarking on their military career, whereas in Top Guns, we're at that stage where we're, we're actually looking at people who are well advanced in their career, although there is still training going, going on. 
So um, coming coming back back to you, Mark. Tell me how you, you say the RAF were looking at this from the point of view of opening the, the the windows a bit so we could see what goes on in the RAF. Um, but so did they approach Channel Four? Did they approach True North? How how did the series come about? So it's a bit of a long-winded uh, story, but the sort of the the abridged version is that um, I made a se- I've made three series called Warship Life at Sea for Channel Five, and then I made a series called Submarine Life Under the Waves. Um, so I'd been in in and around the military programming space for some time, and I'd had conversations with the RAF about doing something similar, but they'd said it wasn't the right time. They weren't quite sure what it was. They'd never really done an observational documentary before. And we sort of left it, um, that was pre-pandemic, and we sort of left it at that stage, parked, um, as it were. And then we sort of got wind that, that Channel 4 were looking at something male skewing, potentially. Um, we were talking you know, to the Army and the RAF and the Navy at that time about you know, what, what our options might be, what access was on the table. Um, and all of a sudden, the RAF just, just said, look, you know, the, the timing is now right for us to do an observational documentary to invite you into one of our bases and showcase what we do, you know, sort of access most nearly all areas. Um, I, but the, the original of the original iteration, what they wanted to do was to sell Lossy Mouth as a location primarily because they have a difficulty internally with people wanting to go and, and live that far North. So we said, okay, you know, we'll have a look at it. Well, can we come and visit? And they, we went and visited and they invited two other Indies up there as well. So it was a tendered process in the end um, by the MOD, which they have to be um, these days. Uh, even though it was our sort of idea and our approach, they have to then tender it. So you, there's a bit of risk involved with, you know, your idea could be stolen if another Indie comes in with a better iteration of your idea. But we already had Channel 4 sort of, you know, warmed up and interested at that, at that stage. And luckily enough, we were chosen to make the programme. Um, but it became quite clear quite quickly that, um, the challenge of the access would be the next difficult thing that we'd have to to sort of tackle because winning the access was one thing, making the show was another. They were not geared up to inviting cameras in. They hadn't realised what that actually meant. Um, and the reality of it on the ground was, in the early days anyway, uh, they almost treated us as news crews, very controlled access, an hour here, an hour there, stop asking that question. It wasn't true observational documentary storytelling initially. So it took some time to sort of learn together how to do this because we, I'd never made a program with the RAF before. I didn't know the intricacies of things like how national security works in, in certain areas in their world. And they equally didn't know how to make an observational documentary, what we would need, the freedoms that we would need. You know, initially we, we, we couldn't even go to the loo without being escorted, you know, with or without cameras. It was everywhere we go, there were minders everywhere. And that affected our relationships with contributors. So it took some time, um, but but you know it, it was definitely hard won access, um, and it was it, it it wasn't there until it was right at the end, you know, of the process. Really, it was it was a constant sort of effort working with our partners at the RAF and and and, and with the production team to sort of deliver this into something that was watchable at the end of the day. Well, it's developing that relationship of trust and respect on both sides, isn't it? Especially in an operational place like Lossy Mouth, where actually there's national security issues as well. So how were you prepared and how how was your team prepared to be able to engage effectively in what is basically a a, a security, a secure area? Well it's something that I've 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 sort of that that again has been a journey as well. So for the last sort of four or five years that I've been making these sort of military programs, so I've got into it by accident really. It wasn't something that I set out to do. I remember making Warship Series One and um, I had a, a senior PD called Paul Wells that I'd put on board a ship um, uh, who was working for me at the time off the coast of Syria with missiles flying in to take out Assad's chemical weapons program. Um, and, and, and that was my sort of baptism of fire, really, into the world of, uh, they call it OPSEC, operational security, which is their fancy word of saying national security. How to, um, There's a lot of military secrets that go on when you're dealing with military operations down to the timings of things, the process, how things happen, when things happen, who does it, the capabilities. Um, and you've got to navigate right up to that line because, of course, we're duty-bound to tell the truth. But if we tell the truth, we're in breach of national security. So it's a delicate dance of things you can say or things that you shouldn't say in order to navigate that line. And it's just through trial and error. It's through reviewing 
episode after episode after, after episode with people within the Ministry of Defence, Defence Intelligence, Permanent Joint Headquarters, DDC inside the MOD and, and people in the Navy, that I learned that process and I learned how to how to navigate that successfully because ultimately I don't want to spend 10 weeks editing an episode, put it in front of the MOD for sign-off and they go, no, you can't tell that, you can't do that. It, I need to know what, where this line is, what I can and can't say whilst we're editing so that I can figure it out. So I need to know everything that they know, which is quite difficult. So luckily enough, I've, I managed to get myself security cleared by, which is a government process by um, an organization called UKSV, UK Security Vetting. Um, when I made a series on submarines, that means I'm now, I can now have a seat at that table and I can be told some of these aspects of the military world that I need to know for the edit and I can navigate that OPSEC line. That's how I managed to get access to to operations, military operations, um, and get that close to the tip of the spear, as they call it. And you just talked about um, getting a, a, a PD and Paul Wells coming to help you on, on warship. And so, and it's it's quite a, a specific genre of documentary making. Is it, do you know who you're going to need for, for a particular programme? Is it a kind of set group you all go to? Or is it quite broad and wide? It's really difficult because, you know, initially when you, when you look at it, the first thing, the first challenge is how many people can I put on the project? And that's, yes, it's got, that's limited a little bit by budget, but it's also limited by what the MOD tell me I can do. So on Warship, it was two people. So it was Paul and another uh, another PD. Uh, and it was just those two people embarking on a Warship for, I think, four to eight weeks at a time, Paul, I think, at the time, wasn't it? Which was quite quite prolonged. Um, that wasn't straightforward because the first ship we got on broke down in Suda Bay uh, and then came home and we wasted two months of the budget and had to start again. Uh, and then we got on another warship at the 11th hour, HMS Duncan, and, and it did some amazing things in the Black Sea and in the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, and then we, we came back for more. So it's, it's it's really difficult when you're sort of setting out to sort of know, know who to go for. You want a good mix of age. You want a good mix of, of, of gender and of background. You know, you don't want two filmmakers that are the same because you often get the same result from both of them. You want them to view things differently and bounce off each other and challenge each other editorially, they, you know, on a warship. And similarly, it happens on a, you know, on an air base as well. If something's happening, they shut the comms down. They go dark and they're on their own. So you have to know that editorially they're robust enough to survive and manage whatever circumstances they're in and come out the other side when those comms are lifted with the right rushes because I can't be in contact with them during that time. They literally cut off. And the same was true on a submarine. When I put a team on a submarine, it was two people. They dived and they they literally came up seven weeks later. They were cut off the entire time. And I've got to know that these people are going to come up with the, the good stuff at the end. Otherwise, you know, uh, it's a lot of money wasted. Um, so I need experienced filmmakers. I, I need people who are very trustworthy. You also need, you know, with great respect to everyone that, that I've worked with, very safe pairs of hands because the military, despite being a bunch of killers on one hand, are very, very sensitive. And, you know, if you say something that's out of line or out of step or not in line with their culture, uh, very quickly your access can change. And we've had access problems like that where someone's been overheard saying something and suddenly people are withdrawing and the access is shutting down. And I've had to bring people off projects in the past and replace them for that reason. Um, you know, you cut these people in half, it says the organization they work for. They can take the mick out of that organization, but we can't. Um, we've got to be deferential. We've got to be polite. You know, I, I say to everybody, we're guests in their house. And that's the mindset you've got to go in with. It's pleasing. I, mean, I think, times. I think it, it, in this kind of filming, filmmaking, the kind of first and foremost, the skills you need are kind of communication and people skills, not necessarily filmmaking skills. They're partly obviously part of it. But yeah, it's that kind of, and that's true of all access based documentaries, I think. But it's, you know, it doesn't matter how good a camera operator you are, if you can't build the trust and relationship with the contributors and also understand the culture of the organisation to and navigate that culture so that you don't fall foul of that. Otherwise, you'll be in all sorts of trouble. So we were definitely looking, and I'm sure Mark would say this, you know, looking for people that had experience of making those kind of films. There's a lot of police and hospital access based obstacles, probably more that at least give you that sense that someone's had that experience. And it's similar, you know, gaining the trust of a doctor and a patient, gaining the trust of a police officer who's very suspicious by nature is a similar kind of skill. And I come from a world of doing lots of hospital and police as well as military um, 
docs, which is probably something you might look for on CVs and I would look for on CVs. You know, have they done a, if they haven't done a military show, have they done a hospital show or um, something like that? Yeah, I, mean, I remember looking at your CV when I first employed you, Paul, and, and it was, you know, I'm looking for those 9 p.m. blue chip, blue light sort of documentaries, the hospitals, the ambulances that tell me, okay, they're good with access, they're good with evolving storylines, they're good working on their own pretty autonomously, they're a safe pair of hands. You know, that that's the sort of thing you've got to look for because there aren't that many military shows out there. And, and you know, I, I think a lot of people that I have worked with on the military shows don't want to do it again. It's quite an intense intense thing to do. Um, so you, you, you often struggle to find people that want to come back and do another, you know, three months on a submarine because they've, they've done it once and they know not to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't other... go back for second series of Warship, for example. Oh, right. You came back for Top Guns, though, so cheers to that. Uh, yeah, exactly. But I think uh, the, with, with the military ones, you're actually embedded with them for su such, such a long time. But at the same time, as you've just said, Mark, you have to be slightly distanced as well. You're not part of it, but you're embedded within that, that, that culture. But also you've got to be thinking all the time of what's happening here from from the military perspective and what are the stories that I am getting and how can I make sure I've got full coverage of as much as possible it's going to make this an exciting series uh, and going back back to Top Guns for, uh, for, for a moment with that there were so many different elements to it but so many where you get a sense that you couldn't really control some of what the story was going to be at the time that you thought it was happening because of the security issues around it. I'm thinking particularly of the typhoon operations. We saw a lot. If you've watched it, you'll know there's a lot of typhoon operations that are fascinating. But that in itself gave a kind of logistical, some logistical difficulties, didn't it? Yeah, hugely. So, you know, our starting point was, well, how are we going to film these things in the air and get enough shots of them? And that was an exercise in itself. You have to try to cherry pick the the flights that are over land or near land, get the longest lenses you can possibly get just to physically get them. But then obviously that's not the story. The story is actually what's going on inside the cockpit. There's only room for one person. So how are we going to capture that? Well, no one had considered that before. And, um, you know, we could get cameras in there, GoPros effectively, that gave us a forward looking shot and a pilot facing shot. That's fine, but it's so loud in the cockpit that, that can't tell the story, and you're limited by what the lens can see. Often, you know, in, in in the sky, things are taking place over great distances and at great speeds. So we needed to figure out a way to get the the the, the comms, the audio, uh, and also we we knew that on occasion pilots flew with a long range camera called a pod camera, which is on the strapped to the bottom of the fuselage of the plane, and it's got a, you know sees about five miles um, through cloud. It's very very clever. Um, but no one had ever attempted to unlock either the audio or that pod camera before. So I literally had to go in and invent that workflow using the knowledge that I'd accumulated over the last few years to say, look, here's how I'm going to redact enough, you know, and the whole workflow, how you do it on a secret laptop and, and the software that you use, it's a massive challenge and a massive headache. Uh, and, it, and it's not there to go lightly. But once we figured out that it could be done, the next challenge became, okay, well, how do we know what's going on in the cockpit? Because you can film a great brief with a pilot who might not have a rough idea of what his mission is going to be. They take off. You don't know what's happened until they land. And that could be six hours time. There's no way of listening in because the minute they're out of the air traffic control airspace, which is about 20 miles from the airfield, they're gone. They, they, they switch to a different comm system. So we, we would only find out when they were back. So the amount of filming we had to do that were, you know, false starts, nothing happened, planes broke, mission aborted, you know, it didn't happen as, as intended. They were tasked on to do something else and we can't tell that for national security reasons. We probably filmed, you know, six or seven times the amount of, of missions that you saw on television and, and the majority of those had to fall by the wayside because they didn't stand up, we didn't have the information. Then of course, there's the other challenge that when you get back and you realize actually it's, it, it's a lot better than you in, imagined because something else has happened, you've then got to reverse engineer that story and fill in the holes either with pickups or, you know, but whilst maintaining viewer trust at all times, it's really, really difficult to sort of reverse engineer those rushes or get the pickups without cheating. So, um, you know, often it was it was a challenge in the edit. The, the, the material would drop in at the 11th hour into the edit. We'd sort of unlock the audio in the cockpit and the, the pod camera. And then finally we get to see the mission and then realize, oh, hang on a minute, we've, we've got some, we've got gold here. Now we need to go and interview that pilot again. He can give us that master interview that can explain what's going on. 
piece it together with the briefing that you shot and the debriefing that you shot. And then you need all the other stuff, you know, the pilot saying goodbye to his kids before that. Um, and then going and playing snooker with his friends afterwards or celebrating with a beer. Only then does it all come together. Um, but it's, there's a lot riding on those flights and a lot of effort because, you know, to get that that material out of the cockpit, to even get the GoPros in there in the first place, you know, and the GoPro housing takes 24 hours to cure because it can't, it can't fly loose and hit the pilot in the head. You can imagine if it knocked him out, that's a bad, it's a bad headline for True North, especially if the plane crashes. So, yeah. um, so the, the, the housing in the, in the, in the cockpit that holds the GoPro needs, needs to be glued in 24 hours in advance of the flight. Well, the RAF regularly change which planes going to be flying and there aren't enough GoPros to put them in every jet. So you can put your eggs in that basket and then the following day you'll come and it's the, it's the other plane mm-hmm. and your pilot has to go up and you, there's nothing you can do. you just got to go, you know, and you don't have the footage. From the filmmaker's perspective, I, when I was on the ground, I, I didn't spend ages on the ground. I spent um, a, a month sort of filling in with um, uh, on, on, um, on Top Gun towards the end of their production. Um, but um, what was quite frustrating from the filmmaker's perspective on the ground was that normally you're used to kind of knowing what your story is um, because it happens in front of you and you can see it and you're filming it. But on um, Top Gun, we you film your brief and then they disappear and you don't know what's happened <laughs> and you can't prepare. You just have to wait and maybe go and get some GVs or do some other things that you might need. Um, and then make sure you're in the right place when they land. And then you find out what happened. Maybe you don't have that air filtered version of what happened, not your necessary, you know, the, the interesting thing where the mistake happened, they might not want to tell you about. So I think in, on this series, even more than most, and we always say that these kind of series are made in the edit anyway. Um, um, the edit became so important because you, that's where you, you finally can figure out what your story is. Yeah. And what was the time gap for, for say, a, a, a an operation uh, between them coming back, you had the briefing, and then you getting all of that workflow coming through from the GoPro. So, the and the, the shortest we had it down to was about a week. A week. The, long, the longest one particular flight uh, to get all of the necessary, from, from filming the, the briefing to having everything on the timeline was eight months. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And is that because of sensitivities around it and checking and making sure it would, would, you know, the RAF were happy with releasing it? Yeah, a little bit. A little bit. That, that was a contributing factor. Availability of, of, of the pilot was another one. You know, th- there were lots of contributing factors. You know, suddenly, you know, the, from simple things that we need to go and do a pickup, oh, that pilot's gone on a course in America for two months. Sorry, he's back. You know, th- there's a lot of that. You know, um, the, the RAF don't stay still. You know, none of the military do. And and when you want them and or when you need them, they're never in the right place. <laughs> um so it, that that's always tricky. But you know, unlocking the the, the cockpit footage and, and audio from both the Typhoon and the, the P8 Poseidon that we were filming on was was a huge challenge. Like I say, it's never been done before, never even attempted before. There was a lot of nervousness around it. Um, and it meant that getting all the component parts were extremely difficult. You know, it was unlike warship that Paul that Paul made when they um you know, everything's there and it's happening right in front of you. It's in camera. There's nothing else you need um, because the people are stood there. Um, when you're relying on unlocking systems that are highly classified and designed not to be able to rip things off and you want to rip things off that system, you know, that that's when it becomes quite a headache and a lot of people get nervous about that. And that's, you know, we were saying to Paul earlier that um, in defence as a culture of just saying no, because it's easier to say no than yes. No means no risk. No means you've done your job. Tick, you get promoted. If you say yes to something and something goes wrong, it's on you. And they don't, they don't like that. Um, so convincing people to, to do something and proving that it's right is where, where it takes time. I think I think one of the things that comes through from both the programmes is this element of, of, of jeopardy as well, whether that's the, um, the pilots who are still going through their training and waiting to be signed off. Uh, but also then on the operations, the jeopardy they experience out there that we only read about in the newspapers sometime a- afterwards. But of course, there's one one thing that happened, Mark, wasn't there, that, that happened as soon as you got into, into Lossy Mouth uh, with the death of the Queen. No, yeah, that was our, that that. Was our first week of filming. And, and, and um, I, I'm sure Paul can attest to this as well, that sometimes you get lucky when you're filming 
you, and you can just roll and, and things happen in front of you. And it's wonderful when that happens. Um, but that was our first week. We, the access wasn't there. It was it was very, very tricky time for that to happen because we naturally wanted to to cover it. We wanted to push and we wanted to get people responding on quite an emotional level. You know, she's the commander in chief of the armed forces. Um, and, and the death of the Queen was a huge event nationally. And it was a, it was a massive seismic event within the military. And we happened to be inside, you know, the closest military base at the time, closest air base at the time um, to Balmoral, um, where she died. So that was quite fascinating. And it gave birth to a military operation that we managed to cover. Um, so, you know, to be fair to Lossie, they did, you know, show some faith in us at that time. Um, I, I, but yeah, that, that's sort of the, you know, the cynical side of it. I, I tell you, sometimes you get you get it right. You know, horrible things happen and you happen to be in there and it's a great story. Um, you know, I mentioned the Syria thing with you earlier, Paul. It was very similar in that aspect. It's horrible, horrible this thing's happening in the world, and yet the access you've got means it's remarkable television that you can't ever manufacture. That's sort of the the dichotomy that we face a little bit. Um, but I think that it that speaks to why I like making these programs, is because it tells us something about, you know, the world that we live in that we'd never normally get to see. Yeah. I think the other thing about that episode, because I think it was around episode four, we saw we saw that coming through was that we started to get to know these characters that you, you were following, and they were mainly non-emotional or very chipper about things. And suddenly we saw an emotional side to them as they were dealing with uh, the death of somebody who was very important to them in the military. And I think that was a really interesting moment to suddenly see that emotion coming through. And I was quite surprised by it, the, the degree of emotion that was coming through from from the, the people on the ground up at Lossy Mouth. Yeah, it's, it's tricky. When you're filming with the military, they like to stay in their lane. You know, they remember their training. They remember the professional hat that they wear. You know, when they speak, it's not just them speaking. They're speaking on behalf of the armed forces that they, re that they represent. So sometimes it's quite difficult to get either the humour at one end of the spectrum, which is usually quite dark, sometimes quite macabre and, and vastly inappropriate, um, and, and emotion similarly is also quite difficult to sometimes get because the armed forces don't show emotion. You know, that it's it's trained out of them to almost be a little bit not robotic, but um, you know, follow the procedures to to not overanalyze something. You know, that comes later when when it's actions on, as they say, it's you do this, you do this, you do this, you know, follow the procedure. So to get, you know, good degrees of humor and warmth and humanity and emotion in there. It is really difficult with the military. It's always been sort of one of the biggest challenges is to reflect what life is really like. Because when you go on, go into these places, they're remarkable environments and the people there are, are largely amazing. They're, they're an amazing bunch who do incredible jobs. And we want to reflect what that's really like, but it almost feels like sometimes they're, they're some of it's because they're guarded. You know, they've, there's been headlines in the past and they're wary of that. And some of it's because they they're speaking on behalf of, you know the armed force that they represent, so they they you know literally put them, they remember their rank and speak with rank first. So it's it's difficult, isn't it, Paul? I mean, to get yeah, them and, and, and they are. I mean, my uh, soldier of the series, you know, is is following people changing from civilians to um, to military personnel, and and actually that process is designed to sort of strip away some of that. Emo they don't want people that are incredibly emotional. They are point of not the whole point, but part of the process is to sort of strip that away and kind of build robust, strong people that don't show emotion, that aren't affected by all the kind of things they may be asked to do. So that's sort of part of the process that sort of they're, they're trained to not do that. So as a filmmaker, you obviously want to um, get to the bottom of emotion and how do people feel about things. And we spent six months with these recruits trying to kind of get some emotion and tell, find out who they really were. And at this, whilst at the same time, they're being trained to kind of put aside who they were before and change. So um, it is a challenge. Um, but um, at the same time, that challenge, you know, I think both on both on both series, we've managed to get behind that veneer a little bit and, and sort of actually who are these people and, and what motivates them and why are they doing it? So. Yeah. And I think one of the things about Soldier, and I, I, I promise not to give any spoilers because we only had the first episode going out so far, but I think in the first episode when you see, I think it's Private Stretton, and he's very smiley and very, and he, he's 17 years old when we first come across him. And you can see when he first walks in, they're making it, the, the, the uh, uh, corporal or whatever is making a comment about that. And then they say later on, he's always smiling and we've got to, 
take gotta get that out of him. Yeah. Well, seriously, we've got to take that out of the, out of him. And you just see this 17 year old, I mean, 17, 18 year olds. I, I don't know how old the oldest one, but I think the oldest one that I saw was about 21 or something, who seemed really old in comparison to the 17 and 18 year olds. I just say they're coming in and there's jeopardy. They've got, is it five months to get through this course? And it's not easy. Anybody who's seen the first episode will know it's not easy. I'd, I'd, have, I'd have run a mile. But then you've got 45 trainees coming through you know they're not all going to get through but for you you've got 45 potential cast members in the trainees and then you've got all the uh you've got lieutenant wahab and you've got the sergeant and the corporals etc how do you go about choosing which ones you're going to follow because you can't follow all 45 from the beginning I would that's, a good, that's a good question it was a real it was a, a headache and a challenge but um we there is a process and we've thought carefully about how we do it we um we we did some pre-casting um so we did have some about a month um of pre-casting and that went basically everyone that was due to start um there's about 180 recruits into Catterick the month that we joined and we got the army help facilitate a kind of an approach to all of those people um to say you know label one is the production company that are making this which i should have a shout out to them and, and the great people that work there lorraine and fran and simon who kind of were the executive producers on this um so Lab label one had sort of sent a letter out to all of those um recruits and then anyone that came back it's obviously data protection anyone that then responded to that then we had access to approach them ourselves so we approached and spoke to about oh, i can't remember all the numbers but we probably spoke to about 30 or 40 of those 180 recruits and started to just do a bit of pre-casting gauge interest and also explain what we're doing and we wanted to film some of them because this series for us was all about transformation because it's and the bbc were very keen on that transformation that transformation of a a young 17 18 19 civilian to an infantry soldier that may be asked to go onto the front line on any kind of military operation like you know some of those recruits are now in Estonia on the front line between the border between, you know, Russia and and who knows what could happen in the next few months. So, you know, they could be asked to be on the front line. So we want to see that transformation. So we we spent um, a lot of time sort of talking to them, explaining what we're doing and trying to find those characters that have something about them, which, you know, most people know that you're looking for some spark, whether it's something interesting about them. It's not always the obvious things, but um, so we, we managed to speak to and actually film eight or so of the recruits at home. Um, and we didn't know how we were going to use that footage. We envisaged that episode one might start with them at home. Um, it turns out we didn't do that. Um, but you'll see, for example, in episode one, there are interviews with the family and with the recruits. And we visit a couple of the recruits back home um, as the episode has begun. And that's actually them before they started. So, so we managed, we wanted to make sure we captured that moment of them before they were soldiers, um, you know, before they were in the military to sort of be able to show that process. And then on the ground, we had probably spoken to about 20 of our platoon by the time they all arrived, but there was another 25 that we hadn't on day one. So that first week we were then, the team were out. They'd all agreed and knew that we were there no one turned up on day one not knowing that we were there, although that might not be quite the case because of some of the classic army kind of administration that went a bit wrong. A couple of people turned up and were a bit surprised to see us, to be honest. But um, And then it's, that you know, that you're looking then for, you might have missed some of those great characters. And I will say, like, behind you, there's a guy with glasses, um, Private South, who isn't in Ep 1 because we weren't filming him. I think personally, he's one of my favorite characters of the series and he comes through kind of in Ep 3, 4 and 5. Um, and that was because we were so busy filming our kind of 8 or 10 that we first started with that how great he was only kind of emerged as our filming went down the line. And, and so you're always looking for, even though you've got your cast of characters, we weren't said, well, we're only filming these eight and we're not going to follow the other 30. Because if we did that, then the interesting things and the interesting people might... So we were keep always keeping an eye on all of them as we went along the road, and um, yeah, but like it was it was difficult. It was a challenge with the forty five. It almost wanted like that number to be smaller, but at the same time, if you limit your number too much, then the stories and the diversity of the cast isn't isn't so much there. 
Yeah, and I think that diversity is important. Obviously, in Top top Guns, it's rather more difficult to get a, a kind of uh, diversity in terms of sex. Uh, but there was diversity in terms of ethnicity. Uh, uh, but in, in, in Soldier, there were, because the army takes women in for the infantry, and they go through exactly the same training, um, you did have... Um, at least two women that you were you were able to film as well. So how important was it to you, Paul, that to have that degree of diversity? I mean, incredibly important both to us as mm. filmmakers and to the BBC. I mean, it was a gift um, for us as filmmakers that we the, the there was these four women in the platoon, and we follow two um, because obviously it's fascinating and interesting. <laughs> They've only women have only been in allowed into military since 2018, and this is definitely the first time that um, any women have been filmed on this training course because there have been um, series about infantry training and military training before, but this is the first time that um, women had ever been filmed doing an infantry training course. So to be able to um, show what they have to go through and that they're entering a quite a male-dominated world, and the extra challenges that that gave them was really really important to us. But it definitely provided an extra level of difficulty for them to do the course, but also difficulty for us to get the access to that because of the sensitivity. So it was a it was um it was difficult for them as the which you can see in the program as the program develops the challenges that they face. Like the girls have to do the same physical challenges that the boys do. There's absolutely no um, change in the restrictions. Um, and for one of the girls, hope. Manwaring, Man- Manwaring, I just gave her the wrong name. Um, she has to carry weight um, on a 4K hike that is only 10 kilograms less than she weighs. So she's, whereas the, some of the boys are carrying the same size weight, but that's only a third of their body weight. Or so the physical challenge for the girls is actually stronger or harder. So they did really struggle, but it was really important for us that we followed that element of the course. And I think it obviously makes for a a strong and interesting story because it's an extra challenge that they have to face but also kind of shows what you know the the reality of it um so yeah but at the same time like as much and you know people will know that like you you hear things about diversity and diversity quotas but I think the most important thing is that you have a good story um Mm. like you know you are looking for diversity in your cast but you're also looking for great characters. (laughs) And that first and foremost is what you, you know, great characters with great story. And I think that, um, you know, both with those girls, I thought were great characters with with good stories as well. Um, So yeah, you're you're kind of looking for that as well. Yeah, because you don't want tokenism, you know, they're there just because of of diversity and great stories they are without giving any spoilers away. I think the the other aspect of it for me is the relationships that were developed with the um commanding officer so lieutenant wahab and the sergeant and the and the corporals because you know like mark was saying about the raf needing something that actually showed a positive light on things the army is, itself even recently has had some very negative publicity particularly around the way that that, that women are treated and um in a way, this this actually gave everybody an opportunity to show what happens, but actually in a very supportive way. OK, you're getting shouted at, you're getting sworn at and everything, but you can see it didn't matter who you were. You had somebody running alongside you telling you to just keep going, just keep going. You're doing it. Keep going. You know, it, there, there was support there. I think, was- I think that's probably, again, why uh, the story as to why we're there is probably similar um uh, to mark's story and i didn't Im- i wasn't involved in getting the access in the first place that was label one and that happened all before i started but um uh, and they their their journey might have been similar to mark's in terms of how that access was gained but the reason that we're there and the reason the army have let us in is because they want to open the doors to show what it's really like to be a bit more transparent about because they are getting brad press and sometimes that brad press is fair and deserved but sometimes it doesn't have all the nuances or context around it. And I suppose letting us in and seeing how they do train infantry soldiers and how they do train women, treat women the same as men, and now um, was important for them. Um, and I guess that's why we're yeah why we've been given that privilege access. Um, so yeah, they they are hard on them, but they're 
caring <laughs> in their yeah. own special way, which sort of comes across in the, the kind of own unique way um, in, in that classic kind of tough a military environment. But, you know, they they care about these recruits and they want them to succeed and they're they're egging them on. And that, you know, that's their job is to to, you know, and not everyone makes it to the end, but they desperately want them all to. And they give everyone the opportunity to. Yeah, no, that's clear. Now, just one, one thing more about Soldier is that, that, you know, you talked about the recruits having to do all these these exercises and these runs with all this kit on them. Presumably, your camera operators were having to race along as well. With <laughs> Probably not yeah. with 40 k kilo, kilos on their back, but... Uh, yeah, but cameras are pretty heavy, I'll tell you. Um, right. Yeah, that this was the most difficult physical challenge of filming I've ever had. Um I think I'd probably underestimated it. Um and it was a challenge because a lot of the filming and filmmaking I've done has been might be in a police car or might be in a hospital or even on a warship. Like it's all fairly contained. But this is a very physical um process training a soldier on the especially the infant infanteers are the recruits they need to work get on the front line and they're 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 required their standards of fitness are, are quite high and they're required to carry i'm going to get all the stats wrong here but i think it's 25 kilograms of weight up to four kilometers in a set time in like under four minutes i think i'm getting that all wrong but they've certainly got some really high challenges but they're not going to wait for us and we've got to film it and how are we going to film it so um there were some real challenges in terms of uh, how do we capture, because they're not going to stop around the corner and wait for us to catch up with them. There was a lot of running that I did. Um, I'm a camera operator. I shoot shot a lot of the series as well. And there's a team of us. And then sort of strategic positioning of kind of the the next PD that might take over from me when I've run out and then jumping in a vehicle and then trying to get ahead of them again. Um, use of drone and use of gimbal and use of GoPros and just kind of those... But I, on a daily basis, I was challenged with, from a directing point of view, like, oh, did you know tomorrow we're going to the firing range? Or in two days, we're going to the firing range. I was like, oh, great, great. That would be a great scene. Oh, but you can't stand here, here, here or here. And you can only stand back over here. And then I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, I'm not going to be able to see what I need to see. So there's a real, from a director's perspective, this series is a real challenge. Um I, the drone became a I, in lockdown. I took my drone pilot license because I wasn't working, and I thought it would be a good idea. And I was very pleased I did because having the ability to get the drone up across the kind of Yorkshire Dales when they were off doing their hikes, um, you know, we couldn't always be with them, but you could get the drone up and get the perspective. And some of the drone photography helps lift it. Then you strategically place your kind of crew along the route, um, and I and I had one of the younger APs who was a lot fitter than I was with a little gimbal and a GoPro that would sometimes just do the whole run with them. Um, but I did a lot of running uh, and a lot of weight. And in fact, forgive me for going on, but like the worst one was some of the night stuff. So they would do nighttime hikes to a fake battle, an imaginary battle they're performing when they're on exercise. And I remember being in up in Scotland, two in the morning, um, the recruits get up pre-dawn to go and hike to the pre the dawn battle but they're going through a swamp and they've got night sights but i didn't have a night sight did i i was just my camera and my night vision camera and i remember falling into like um water that was like up to my waist going oh my goodness what what how have i ended up and the recruits are all just walking past me but it features in episode five i think um and it was a key moment because it's when one of our key characters gets injured and his injury, and if we hadn't been there hiking through that um, uh, that swamp that night, we'd have missed that key moment in his storyline. So, yeah, it was a real challenge physically. Um, and the, if any of the rest of the crew that are on here, I should shout out to them because they all, you know, worked really hard and physically as well as emotionally and mentally, kind of challenges that that they had to do. No, and and it's. Um... It's great to hear how much you were actually directly involved in this and, uh, and and actually going through the same kind of swamps as well. I'm surprised you didn't get a medal at the end yourself. I did actually, bless him, the, um, the, 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 the commanding officer gave me a little um, 
a medal to say that I'd um, uh, achieved it. I've got it somewhere. Um, That's fantastic. So, so I, I got my own little ITC Catterick medal for myself. Me and the series producer, Kim Roster, should also give a shout out. Uh, wouldn't have been possible without her. Um, uh, both got little medals um, to, to commemorate our experiences on the Oh, well, that's excellent. That's excellent. And, and of course, we recognise that behind both of these is a huge team of people all working together. Yeah, so I should say there was a team. On the screen looks so, look so wonderful. There's a team of but, sort of three or four directors and APs, some great um, directors and APs, and then series producer Kim and producers Alice. Like There was a big, big team. It wasn't me that made this series. Although the Telegraph hilariously said, just, just put my name in it, which I did think was quite funny and I shared among the team. But um <laughs> Well, we're coming up towards the end of this now, and I hope whoever's, however many people are watching this, that, that we've been able to answer any questions you've got about this. I just want to ask one more, though, because you both have track records in these sort of docs and, and observational docs, blue light docs, etc. Why do you think they're so popular? What is it about them that really works for us as an audience? I'll let you take it first, Mark. <laughs> I, th I genuinely think it's because this sort of television, it's not the sort of thing you see... On, on on screen every week you know there are a lot of iterations of blue light stuff out there police ambulance and we know it rates but it's quite hard to reinvent that and make that feel new and fresh and relevant here it, it, it's a world that we don't often get to look inside um i've never done military training i've sort of steered away from that and done more the military operations so speaking to that um i i think i think seeing things you know when a ship sails over the horizon when a when a plane's flying over badlands you know we also how successful Maverick was T to be there with these people in these remarkable circumstances is, is astonishing, but they're just like us. You know, they have the same problems. They've got family issues, uh, you know, phones running out of battery, all that sort of stuff that goes on in their lives is happening in our lives too. So I think it's, I think it's a fascination with people just like us in incredible set of circumstances in a remarkable world that we have, we know very, very little about with real stakes and real consequences. If things go wrong, you know, we, it said, in, you know, one of the pilots in Top Guns, Jake Desmond, who says, if it goes wrong, it's World War Three. That's the stakes. We, in our lives, we can't identify with that. You know, if it goes wrong for us on a day, we might be home late, we might crash the car, but nobody dies and it isn't World War Three. You get it wrong in the plane, you get it wrong on a warship or wrong on a battlefield as a, as a soldier. People die and lots of people could die. So mm -hmm. I, I think it's that. I think it's that it's a fascinating world and to get the chance to hold a mirror up to that. And, and to see what's going on, to see those operators doing doing that job for real, is is it's a privilege. We've got to get it right. We've got to be rigorous in in how we tell the stories. But I think ultimately audiences come to it because they're fascinated by it. It's almost like you know, you mentioned Maverick earlier. What we've tried to make is the real world version of that. Yeah. That's and, and that's why I think it got bums on seats. Right. Mark, yeah, I, I'd wholeheartedly agree with that. Really, it's sort of. It, uh, there's a slightly different thing with the training but ultimately that it's that kind of view into a world you wouldn't normally see and I think everyone has watched SAS Who Dares Wins um, but that's manufactured actually it's you know it's a TV this is sort of the real version of that you know and it was some of those words were used by the BBC when we started talking about it you know well, what do and then you can sit at home and go could I do that and you can kind of ask you put yourself in that because the amount of, you know, you're preparing people to go and become soldiers and potentially in the infantry be that front line of the tip of the spear to use a bayonet to to potentially shoot someone um, on that front line. They're that the first. So would I be able the audience might ask themselves, can I could I do that? Would I be able to do that? And I was shocked by some of the things that I filmed and we didn't want to kind of like you don't realize like, in the end of episode one, there's the bayonet scene, which is quite brutal you know and quite a and the army fortunately didn't want to shy away from that and it was important thing to show because this is the reality of what they're training them to do so i think it's it's that yeah like mark said that view into a world you don't know but then you can kind of put yourself in that you know what would i do if i was in that airplane over estonia or over russia or over or what would i do if i was asked to stab someone with a bayonet you know they're all good questions. I'm not quite sure that's the right place to end this, but it's a, it's a, it's a good question. Could I stab that person with a bayonet? What's next for, for you two? We got any, uh... 
Uh, I, I can't say at the moment. Um, we've got some things up our sleeve. Um, something I'm looking at with Paul, actually, funnily enough. Um, so, you know, obviously Top Gun's one rated, so, you know, we'd be interested in going back into that space. Um, there's still appetite, you know, across all of the armed forces to do more. Uh, we only have to see what's going on in the world in the last week to know that, you know, it, it, we, the army currently are deployed in, you know, in, in Estonia, they've just flown out the weekend to Kosovo or on a UN peacekeeping mission. Uh, the Navy currently have warships in the Eastern Mediterranean um, and the Air Force, you know, are deployed at several locations at any one time as well. So it, it, it's a busy time and, and the world right now is a, is a fairly dangerous place. So, you know, it's, it comes back to that sort of cynicism of, of what we do, you know, but if we go inside these organizations, organizations right now, there is a narrative that's pervasive naturally to tie everything that we see to that's the lens you view it through that one day you know you're looking at soldier paul said it quite eloquently earlier now they're on the front line you know that that's that's the reality of it when you when you when you're in estonia when you're in romania when you're in these locations doing the military operations and it's playing out for real you know that's as serious as it gets you know that's the reality of it but that's it's, it is genuinely as serious as it gets it's 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 do or die and it's one foot wrong and it's world war three so you know, right now to go into to, to to be in the military space, I think is a good place to be. It tells us a lot about what's going on in the world, which way we're heading. Um, and I think it's good for the for the public to know that. Um, there's a lot of messaging as well. The military and you know the MOD and government want to get out. As a result of that, they want to get those messages out. So as long as there's appetite from them and appetite from broadcasters, um, I, I I think I'll be in this space for for a few years yet. Well, that's good. Um Sorry, yeah, uh, I have at the moment, I'm having a few conversations with people, but uh, most, if there are any people who work in TV on here at the moment, they'll know that it is a difficult climate right now, um, commissioning slowdowns. Um, I've had, it's been a difficult year actually for work. I've, I've, I'm not working at the moment. Um, I've had two months off, still looking for my next project. I'm having a few conversations, one with Mark, but um, we can't talk about, but um yeah, like it, it's, it is a difficult environment and like there's probably other freelancers on this that might be unemployed at the moment. Um, if anyone out there with a job, they could, you know, get in contact. Um, I, I still want to make observational documentaries, but I'm also interested in others. And I finished a series for True North, actually, uh, true crime series. So um, Catching a Killer, um, Forensics Catching a Killer, which is coming out on Sky Crime Um I don't know when. Um, so yeah, I, I'm a filmmaker and I want to make great films. So we'll see what the next one will be. I just noticed well, there was a question on here as well that someone's asked about um, CVs. If they don't have blue light shows and that experience, would it rule them out? I, I don't think, it, we always look at everybody's CV fairly and equally. And, and I'm interested in people with different backgrounds. I, I want people to, to view things in different ways. When we're, when we're looking at assembling a team, we don't want two people that are the same because of them one sort of unnecessary. So um, a CV would never rule somebody out. We'll always view people on merit and I, we, we always relish talking to different people. I'm sure, Paul, your, your team on soldiers is the same. We had five at Lossy Mouth at any one time and four on the overseas deployments. That team was was an assembly of, you know, all four corners of the UK, all different sorts of backgrounds, all different sorts of perspectives and upbringings deliberately. So they'd view the content and challenge the content they were seeing differently. So um, so just wanted to answer that question because it's been sat there quite quite for quite some time and no is the answer just because you haven't you haven't got a blue light show like hospital let's say for example or ambulance on your cv it wouldn't rule you out from any discussions about working in this space in the military space yeah you want people that are good with people so if you think you're good with people um then there are other ways to demonstrate that and you but you want to kind of be able to show so any experience that you've got that can show how you are good with people if even if it that's like you know, working in as a working in a shop or working in a coffee shop or that kind of just that kind of like it's people skills that you need to be able to make shows like this first and foremost before you start thinking about your filmmaking skills, your technical skills and camera skills. It's it's people skills. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, I mean, Mark, I'm going to steal, steal one of your comments when you talked about, you know, filming these sorts of things, meaning that you're filming, filming people just like us who are doing extraordinary things. But then people just like yourselves, yourself and your teams have made extraordinary series. So, you know, thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for joining me tonight because you've given us a fascinating insight 
in two of the best documentary series I've seen in a while. I could enjoy the mud without getting cold and wet. No, I couldn't do it uh, in answer to your question, Paul. And I felt like I was flying with those pilots. But it does also show what our military services do and what is asked of them. That gives us lots of food for thought. Mark, Paul, thank you to you and your teams for bringing us these series. And thank you for chatting with me. And of course, on behalf of everybody who's watching and everybody who watches this in the future, we wish you continuing success with your next projects. And maybe, just maybe, we'll be sat around a Zoom room again in the future, looking at things or previewing a new series. Any of that would be just delightful to meet you in person. So I look forward to that. But until next time, to everybody watching, that's goodbye from all of us at RTS Yorkshire.